And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with Jason Quitt. Jason, you were talking a little bit about the pyramids. Exactly why do you think they were constructed? I think that um, they had multiple reasons, but I believe um, from everything that I've been shown is that they are solar symbolism. A pyramid is solar symbolism, especially the ones uh, on in Giza. And uh, they were constructed as a calendar to map the stars and the sun to show the cycles of time. It's a gigantic megalithic clock. Um, and that's just one dimension of what the pyramids are, um, in my uh, opinion. Awesome. How they were built, I, do, I, I couldn't tell you. That still boggles my mind. Oh, it is truly remarkable. I'm just not sure, you know, 100,000 Egyptians tugged those boulders and those huge blocks up and formed the pyramids. I, I don't think they did it that way. The only thing I could think of is they had some type of acoustic technology that could levitate or, or help reduce the mass so they could move them um, and lift them. Yeah, they had, they had a secret to be sure. Now, this code that you have discovered tells us what? It tells us that the most important thing that these mystics uh, looked into, or one of the most important things, was cycles of time. And that there was a reflection of the stars and the sun uh, that could be seen on planet Earth. But most importantly... It was a reflection of the human body, and I think this is the biggest, um, the biggest connection to all of this, is that um, the code is within the physical human body. And the way that ancient people used to measure the sun was they would use their physical bodies as the tool of measurement, because the body follows the fundamental sacred geometry of the universe. It grows with very specific proportions. So when you're looking at the sun in the sky, if you outstretch your arm in front of you and you hold your hand up to the horizon and the sun, the, from your eye, from your perspective, to your hand, to the sky and the sun, equals 15 degrees, one hour of time. So the body was first the measuring tool of the heavens. And the planets and the stars they saw as a reflection within the human body that had an influence and effect on the human body. And um, even, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, again, a Vitruvius man, his famous um, illustration of the human body in the circle and the square showing the, the sacred proportions. And those proportions um, match the ratios that we find in these solar codes. So I think when it really comes down to it, the most important understanding of what this code means is that we are a reflection of the universe. We are um, a reflection of the cycles of time. And all of this information is encoded within our physical bodies. And by using our physical bodies as the measuring stick, the measuring tool, we can measure the cosmos with our arms, our hands, our fingers, our legs, and our feet. And this is also where the, the measuring system of the Egyptians come from. When you think of the cubit system, the cubit system is the measurement from um, the bottom of your elbow to the top or the tip of your middle finger. And the average of that is about 20.5 inches. And then the royal cubit adds four finger lengths above that. Um, so the ancient Egyptian measuring system was based, again, on the arm and the hand. And it's the same thing as the eye looking at the hand to the sun. And if you remember, the, the, um, there's a very popular symbol that's found all over the planet. They call it the hamsa, where it's an it's a illustration of the, ha the hand the open palm hand with an eye in the center of the palm. Hmm. And if you think about that, and what I'm saying to you is that if you take your hand and you take your eye with your outstretched arm and look directly at your palm, the eye to the palm, to the sun, 
you get the measurement of time and space. They were brilliant, weren't they, Jason? Absolutely. But they were so smart that when I'm going through this, even um, uh, like the native communities in America, like Chaco Canyon, the, these, these um, sun daggers, these, these petroglyphs that they designed, like it boggles my mind. I have no idea how they figured it out to be so precisely perfect that they could measure where the sun would be where the shadow would be cast, and where the sun would shine in a very specific point. It's unbelievably precise. Um, so they were, they were geniuses, and our modern mind, you know, when they, we look back, it's like we know they worship the sun, but it wasn't a worship of the sun. It's they, it was a science. They knew how to map the stars. They knew how to use it to navigate and, you know, for us, we look at our watch or, or today we look at our iPhones to get the time. Back then, there wasn't anything like that. How did they know what day it was? How did they know what month it was? Exactly. How did they, they were so smart. They can build monuments that they can just look up at the monument, see where the sun is in perspective to the monument, and know exactly what day it is. We don't have that mindset today. We can't see that. Let's go to the phones for you. Let's start with first-time caller Ruth in Gurney, Illinois. Hi, Ruth. Welcome to the program. Hi, uh, Ms. Denori. I'm so glad to get through to you with such an important conversation I've tried hundreds of times, wondering why people can get through over and over. We have a gold pyramid in Gurney, Illinois, next to Great America. Yep. But your song prior about having known somebody and didn't know where or when, I knew George Armstrong Custer in another life. Uh -huh. He married the Indian chief in this life who came back as a woman. He also married the daughter of an Indian chief whose name in Indian means blame the woman. I believe it's possible that she did have a child, a boy. He did not have any children with Libby Custer. They were soulmates. They were both met in Monroe, Michigan, and he went on to become a West Point cadet and officer, and their braves are in New York at West Point. So the times that I had met him, but before I say it, I want to ask the guest, does he know why the Indians called him Son of the Morning Star? I think it is significantly important. The first time I saw him was in about 1957. I was about 9 or 10 years old at the Museum of Science and Industry. What an incredible gift you possess. Uh, what do you think of that, Jason? Well, um, the name is definitely significant. Um, the, the, the morning star is something that um, these astronomers, these shamans would look at and wait at very specific times. The morning star could be Venus or it could be Sirius. It could be, you know, there is many types of stars or planets that was called the morning star. It is the star or the light in the sky that comes up above the horizon right as the sun rises. And this was, um, it was almost like um, the light of the new world, basically. So it was a very important sign to see a, very, a specific planet or a specific star directly above the horizon to bring in the new sun of the day. It was a very sacred um, ceremony that many cultures around the world would look at. Are you still attempting astral projection, Jason? Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't happen as much as it did about 20 years ago, but um, usually it happens around new moons, full moons. Um, it just, now it just happens more naturally. Let's go to Joe in Monterey, California. Hello, Joseph. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking my call, George. Sure, Joe. Um, I was wondering um, if your guest has ever stood 
um, next to an obelisk, um, they have a certain uh, phenomena, uh, or shall I say a natural occurrence of physics, where the energy will flow through the obelisk in, in, in one direction. If you stand on one side, one side to it, you can feel the energy going through you. And on the other side, you could feel it leaving you. So they knew about uh, sacred geometry and energy. The pyramids are like solar collectors. They collect energy. But, you know, George, you know about uh, antennas. The shape of the antenna will dictate the wave. You capture the wave. Well, these uh, pyramids were also mystery schools. They held mystery uh, schools and teachings inside the pyramid. And uh, that probably um, allowed them to travel out of the body. More importantly, allowed them to receive information from the heavens as well. And also, some of the pyramids had channels of water, like tunnels, underneath. And they say to all the, the, there was like tunnels of water in it. Well, when water flows underground uh, around something, it will enervate you. It will take your energy away. And when it do, stop, doesn't flow, you can get energy. So they use this around the pyramids, from what I was told. Uh, to It's like a safeguard that nobody would go near the pyramids because they would feel weak. Uh, and some people felt that the pyramids might have been uh, a kind of weather control. I think um, Tesla also experimented on, with pyramids and sacred geometry. And a further little tidbit, uh, when I was in, initiated into the Melchizedek, when I was ordained, we did our, our ordination in New York City, the Mason, uh, the, the Mason headquarters, you know, the, the, uh, the Mason Hall in New York City talk about symbolism the shriners thank you right? for taking my call george okay joseph okay you want to react to any of that chase yeah yeah i've heard i've heard all of those things um and and yes even um i've heard about going into the chambers to leave your body it was a way of traveling to the stars using the pyramid also the obelisk remember it's granite and granite is made of quartz so when you take this huge quartz granite obelisk and you put it up on the earth just the sheer weight of it in that spot is going to create a piezoelectric field, which will move electrons like an oscillation. So there is a, a phenomenon around the pyramids and obelisks, and this is why they're so important and they're putting them around the world. Uh, but the uh, piezoelectricity is amplified by the solar radiation. So it is like an antenna and receiver, just as the caller said. Next up, we've got Sandy in Connecticut. Welcome to the show. Hi, Sandy. Um, hello. I'm so happy that I'm able to speak to Jason. I could think I could speak, listen to him every night of the week. <laughs> um, I'd like to re, re, um, relay some things that he's been speaking about. Going okay. back, first of all, um, uh, 12 years ago, 17 years ago, and present time. About 12 years ago, there was, it goes back when I was divorced and um, had to do with my mother-in-law. And I wanted to tell my ex-husband things before I would die. I was 65 years old at the time. And um, I was dreaming. I, I, felt, I, I, I was asleep. And I woke up, but it was strange because I was speaking very uh, fluently going through all the things that she had done. And I was hearing it. It was like my body was in two parts. It reminds me of when Jason spoke in the beginning about sleep paralysis, which I had never heard about. But um, I had that experience, and I really haven't told anybody about it because it seems many things I'll share, but it seems impossible that you could be awake listening to yourself speak and the speaking was coming like from my mind i was listening but it wasn't that i was i was talking and listening to myself not knowing that i was talking well you had a classic case of sleep paralysis sandy uh don't you think jason absolutely and there is a part of us uh you can call it a super conscious or subconscious part of us that in our dream state can communicate with us um, so sometimes in a lucid dream situation, um, I would stop 
And instead of trying to control the dream like like most people, I'll just tune into myself at that specific time and, and start asking questions for my to myself, and I'll hear a voice giving me the answers in the dream. And I think this is also how Edgar Cayce also um, started to channel uh, through his sleep. And Tom's got texts and tweets. Tom, what do you have for Jason? Anything out there? Anything coming in? No. Let's go to Emil in Toronto. Welcome to the show. Go ahead, Emil. Hi, how are you both? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, I was uh, wondering, like, uh, I've been meditating for, like, a number of years now, and uh, since about 2020, I've noticed that I've been, like, uh, uncontrollably uh, rocking back and forth while meditating. Uh, is this, like, a part of a normal thing? <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Oh, no, you're doing fine. Is that normal, Jason? Um, actually, uh Many people experience that. I had uh, a couple close friends um, that would meditate and they would um, shake. Or when they're going through a healing, uh, when, whenever they receive energy healing, uh, their body will shake. And um, for me, seeing that is, is normal. It's a way of how the, the body integrates and moves energy. Um, some people go a little deeper with that and say it has to do with the nervous system and the nervous system is kind of unraveling energy through the body and allowing energy to move through. Um, so I, I, me personally, it, it doesn't happen to me in that way, but I've seen many people go through that. Do you use these techniques, Jason, to do hate healing? Um, yes, but it, it's not in that way. Um, I would use the techniques to build my energy system. And as you build the energy system, you have more access to, let's say, the connection of energy moving through you or the cultivation of energy that you've built. And then as you do energy healing or shamanic work, you connect to that source. And this is what we were talking about earlier where I said, you know, my energy was Swiss cheese and I had to heal it because if I had holes or my energy was weak, my energy can be pulled and influenced very easily, and that is not good. But as I do Qigong, as I do the Egyptian postures and meditate, I'm healing the energetic structure around me, so I'm more capable of being in that flow of energy. So for me, Qigong is basically the foundation of healing because it rebuilds the energy system to allow the energy to move through you. Jason, give out your website if you would, sir. Sure. My website is thecrystalsun.com. And you could also find my books on Amazon just by typing in Jason Quit. I saw the Jeff Bezos story yesterday and how he started Amazon. And it's amazing where the books just took off like crazy, huh? You know, it, it gives an opportunity uh, for self-publishers like myself to um, work on a book and then put it out uh, right directly to an audience on Amazon. And, so. and get it sold, too. And you do a great job, Jace. We're going to come back and take final calls with you in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with Jason Quit as we talk about his remarkable work. What projects are you working on now, Jason? Go to Zoom. I don't think you're going to. There you go. Hello? Oh, go ahead, Jace. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm going to be working on a new book, uh, the second part of the Egyptian Postures book. And I am also going to um, Stairway to the Stars in uh, Las Vegas coming up November 10th, 11th, and 12th to talk about astral genesis. Are you finding that people are getting more and more fascinated with these topics? Absolutely. And, you know, I've been, I've been talking about this for at least a decade now, if not more, and um, it, it just keeps going and going. And um, what I find fascinating is that the topics keep getting richer. So um, what I'm learning today is like light years ahead of what uh, has been talked about 10 years ago. 
So it, it's, it's really an amazing community. That's great. Tom's ready with a text and tweet for you. Jace, what do you got, Tom? Jace, this is from Carrie in West Virginia, and she says, how does Gobekli Tepe and astrogenesis relate to an ice age, or do they? Mm-hmm. Well, the way that it relates is that um, the artifacts and the sites are found when the ice age starts melting. So at the end of the ice age and the first civilizations, you start to get um, Gobekli Tepe and uh, the Neolithic age. So um, how does it relate? It, it just shows you that as the ice receded, uh, cultures began to develop more, and this is where we start to find an explosion of civilization around the planet. Back to the calls east of the Rockies, Brian in Indianapolis. Hey, Brian, go ahead. Hey, George, I got the Daily Double today. I can't believe it. Yes, you did. I had to read I had to redial 92 times to get through today. <laughs> that happens. Hey, hey, listen, real quick. Yes, real quick. They called George Armstrong Armstrong Custer the son of the morning star. The Native Americans called him that because he attacked the, Amer- the Native American villages in the, in the pre-dawn hours. Uh-huh. That's why they did that. That's why they called him that. So, hey, listen, oh. what a great topic, Jason. And I got to thinking, you were talking about all these out-of-the-body experiences that you have. So I got to thinking, do you have a – when you do this, do you have – I got three questions, and I'll take, you can, I'll take the answers off here. When you do this, do you have like a spirit guide that goes with you or are you by yourself? That got me thinking, do you consider yourself a time traveler when you do this because you do it so often? And I don't know – I was talking with Tommy. Do you do you see stuff like George always asked? Do you see stuff that could be or will be? And George, I'll see you in Columbus. We're going to have some good conversations. Okay, Brian, look forward to that. Uh, let's start with the second question about time traveling. You wrote a book about the John Teeter, the time traveler, a couple of years ago, didn't you? I did, uh, and uh, that unraveled very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I, I, that type of time travel, uh, the John, uh, Teeter time travel for me, um, is a hoax. Um, and I kind of figured that out the hard way. And I know a lot of people get angry at me for saying that, but the, the time travel that, um, I do talk about that I would consider to be very much real is the out of body time travel. Because when you leave your body, it's, you're leaving time and space. So you can jump different timelines. Uh, mostly you go back to past lives. So you get to relive or see things over again. And then you have the very rare times where um, you're propelled into the future. And it's very confusing um, and also very frightening. <laughs> um, so, yes, I would consider myself... Uh, an astral time traveler. All right. Um, do you in have that regard? Do you have spirit guides that assist you at all on anything? I believe that they're always there, and uh, it's very strange because sometimes when you're traveling, let's say like you're flying through the air or through space or wherever you're going, it's like they're uh, behind you and they have a hand on your shoulder. And they speak to you telepathically. Uh, so you could like ask questions in your mind and you receive the answers in your mind. But you could feel the presence of them behind you and you have the hand on your shoulder. Um, and then sometimes when you're just out of your body, there's different beings that will come to your bedside to talk to you. Uh, and I consider those to be guides or helpers or, or beings like that. And, of course, one of my favorite slogans are these things that will be or could be when you talk about futuristic events. What do you think about those? Um, I always say they're potentials um, or there are other timelines that have already played out. So it may be like an echo of some other timeline, uh, not necessarily here. So when I uh, see things, um, I don't really believe that what I'm seeing will happen here. 
uh, but I'm open to the possibility that it may happen here. So uh, in, in my mind, it's some it's happened somewhere else, and it's for us a teaching of what could be possible down the road. Let's go to Bob in New York. Hey, Robert, go ahead. Yes. Uh, hello. When I Google the picture of the Last Supper, it appears the one of the 12 disciples uh, that or the apostles that are at the table, the one to the left appears to be a woman. Is that a woman, uh, that person a woman? If so, which of the 12 apostles is missing? And also, in the symbolism, if I look at the, the entire picture, I see the three windows in the back. Is that representing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And what other symbolism is there at that Last Supper? Thank you for the information. Are you familiar with the Last Supper at all, Jason? I am. I am. And I'll start with the windows. It's the three windows, which is uh, the three windows of the solstice and equinox. And these are the um, uh, the windows of Babylon. Um, they're very ancient. They're in ancient structures all over the world. The three windows are designed so that the sun will enter um, the center window during the equinox, and the two windows on the sides are the solstice. The sun will enter through those windows. As for the apostles, yes, um, I believe that apostle is supposed to be John the Baptist. But in this painting, um, it does clearly look like a woman. Um, so they say... Um, Could it have been be, Mary, Mary Magdalene? Yes, and you can see there's another apostle next to them, and their hand is pointing or touching the Adam's apple. Ah, that's intriguing. So it's showing you there is no Adam's apple. It could be Mary. Next up, let's go to John in New Jersey. John, let's get you in here. Go ahead. Hi. Um, we know that in the pyramids, they use this tar-like substance or asphalt for mortar in between the bricks of the pyramids. But you see all these pictures of these workers carrying these jars, you know, and pouring a liquid substance in front of the blocks. You know, I have a theory that they took ships and they took jars to Saudi Arabia and got crude oil and brought it back hmm. along with the tar for the mortar, and they poured it, and they slid the bricks. But I don't know how long it takes for the tar, the asphalt, and the crude oil to break down. What do you think of that as a possibility, John, Jason? Uh, all possibilities you, are open. I, I haven't heard that one specifically, but like I said, I don't have an answer to how they built those pyramids. Um, it's just an incredible wonder. Somehow I think sound resonance had something to do with it. That is the most interesting possibility of all of it. Let's go to Michael in Santa Fe, New Mexico now. Michael, take it away. Uh, hello, George and Jason. Thank you very much. It's a fascinating topic. I Indeed. had a very quick question I wanted to ask. My grandparents had a farm in upstate New York um, near Cornwall. It was Cornwall on the Hudson. And uh, my uncle was actually chief of police up there. And there was... Uh, Night after night, I'd look out the window, and as I was dreaming, uh, I would imagine that I was flying out the window. And uh, I would fly around, and then I would go different places. And I kept returning to this uh, cemetery in uh, Windsor, Windsor, New York, and uh, it was kind of weirding me out. So I put a ball bearing in my pocket. It was about oh, almost an inch and a half in diameter. The same thing happened that night. I flew out the window. I go to the cemetery. There's this obelisk, this very tall. Uh, it was someone's monument. But in the corner of the grass, I put the ball bearing, and then I flew back home and went to sleep. Yeah, I was probably seven or eight years old. And the next morning I got up, and I went to the graveyard, and I peeled up this piece of sod where I had put the ball bearing. And sure enough, there it was. I'd like to ask 
both of you, like Jason, what do you think of that? Um, just, I just got chills from my body. Um, <laughs> Me too. That's, that's an amazing, amazing story. Um, like I as well had a lot of similar experiences of, you know, going to the park behind my house as a child, like flying through the window. But for me, that was just dreams. Uh, what you're describing is an actual much, event, much more. Yeah. And, and, to, to say that it was buried, that that to me says that it, it, when you traveled, you went back in the past and placed that there. Time travel, Jason, is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Truly remarkable. Well, thank you for that call. And let's go next to Steve in Cicero, Illinois. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah. I had something interesting to add to the uh, understanding that the uh, ancient people knew a lot more about science than we knew. Oh, yeah. You're right about that. Okay. I'll give you an example. In the mythology of uh, Hercules' trials, he goes to Atlas to find the golden apples. So, to cut the story quickly, uh, why would Atlas know what the golden apples were? Well, Atlas protects the Earth. And what does an apple have to do with the Earth? It's the shape of the magnetosphere, and it's powered by heavy metals within the Earth, like, like gold and iron. That meant that the, uh, back then they knew what the magnetosphere was. It's like a mnemonic. How, would they, they, how did they know these things, Jason? Did somebody tell them? It's very possible that they had some type of connection to advanced consciousness. Um, what about ETs? Like ET channeling, or they were just advanced. They they were here for a very long time before us. And, uh, you know, the way I look at uh, these things, um, like Hercules, is, is allegorical. And it talks about the golden apples. Um, are this are basically could be looked at as the stars, um, the dra the dragon or the serpent that is around the tree could be uh, Draco in the northern star region, um, and uh, the tree is the um, the Axis Mundi. So the golden apple could be the, the 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 pole star, and as we go through procession, the pole star changes, and that's why there's many golden apples because we have many different pole stars over the ages. How many books have you written now, Jason? I've got at least four here. <laughs> I Right now, publicly, that I'm selling, I, I have two out right now. And um, I think I've written about, I think you have all my books. I have uh, four that I've written, uh, but I'm updating and getting better at writing now. So hopefully there will be a third book for yeah. sale uh, within the year. Just keep doing what you're doing and keep in touch with us, will you please? Of course I will, George. All right, Jason quit his website linked up at coast to coast AM .com. His latest book is called Astral Genesis, Astrological Keys to the Gods. For Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean LaDesour, Stephanie Smith, Chris Burroughs, Tim Benall, George Napanee, and Pat